All right, so welcome to the Decision Maker's Guide to why you should move to Angular 2 now. So my name is Nick Van Wardenberg. I'm the CEO of Wrangle.io, and uh, also with me is Yuri Taktaev, the CTO, the Chief Technical Officer of Wrangle.io. So we're going to talk about why adopting Angular 2 now versus later is important. The easy cases where you have new products or where you have short time frames and you can make your decisions easily. The difficult cases, approaches to migration, and conclusions and next steps. So first off, Wrangle.io, we're a modern development and consulting firm. Uh, we're focused on HTML5 single page apps built with Lean UX and Lean startup processes. We're about 90 staff, including 40 Angular devs, and we have about 50 Angular projects delivered in the last two and a half years. And we've been doing Angular 2 style development since the middle of last year. And we've been working on the official Angular 2 Chrome dev tools, uh, Batarangle, in collaboration with the Angular 2 core team. So why is adopting Angular 2 now versus later important? There's been a huge shift in the modern stack. Uh, the move to components, ES6 and TypeScript, a new architecture for building large web applications, functional immutable benefits um, in large scale applications, a different way of managing data, and a new way of thinking. And this becomes important as Angular applications get bigger. And we've learned a lot over the last few years. Most people think of web applications in terms of a form, but they're not really monolithic applications. As you work on an application, you end up with a collection of components, and those collections have to talk to each other. This is component in just the general sense of looking at an application. What Angular 2 does, it takes the model that we've been using with Angular 1, but it uses a more clear component approach and a different way of communicating across components. And so where you have multiple application states in part of your application and they get messy with them talking to each other, we're now isolating the state, controlling the updates, and managing them in a smooth one-way data flow. And so all updates are controlled and one-way data flow from the application state into the components allows for them to talk to each other without actually having to know much about each other. And that has a drastic impact on how we architect apps. So the impact of Angular 2 is it enables us to build larger applications and has significant performance improvements. It allows us to break larger applications into smaller pieces and you can scale your team up more effectively. You can do a lot of this with Angular 1, but Angular 2 demands this. And this is where it becomes important. If you're not moving to Angular 2 now, you should be moving to Angular 2 type practices or planning them out because it has a massive impact in your long-term application strategy. It's a big shift. And the immediate technical debt that you get is significant because when you're on a prior version, that means you're building something that you'll need to move later in the future. So it's an it's a impact in terms of scaling, but it's also an impact in terms of you know, what you're investing in your application from a continued development perspective. So you can ask yourself, what's your technical debt run rate? How much of your budget is going to technical debt? What's the net present value cost of this? You know, please do the math and make your decisions based upon that. If you're going, you know, if you're on a framework that's many years old and you're using the older style, so Angular 1 as of three years ago, you might have a significant technical debt investment going on because you're writing code that's going to be hard to migrate in the future. It could be 60%, it could be 80%. What you want to do is figure out how you can minimize that so you're getting the most value for your IT spend. But there are risks with Angular 2. There's a few challenges. Um, you might have a large code base written in an older Angular style. This could have an impact on new feature delivery uh, moving. So how do you actually keep delivering features and move to Angular 2? There's a, a cultural desire to rewrite refactor. So when you're working on a new application, um, it's going to be hard to actually manage scope. Uh, there's the team learning Angular 2. And, and Angular 2 still is beta, which is something to consider. But the motivations are great. Um, Angular 1 doesn't scale effectively in bigger applications. Angular 1 projects represent their first, you know, the first phase of SPA architecture. A, a lot of mistakes were made. Um, a lot of things have been learned. So you can fix some of this by adopting the newer approach, a newer approach to Angular 1 inspired by Angular 2 and React, but then you may as well move to Angular 2 if it makes sense. And that's the point of this webinar is really when does it make sense? So some of the key factors to consider, you know, what phase of development are you at? Um, the existing product that's being used. Are you planning? Are, are you planning a product that needs to be launched very soon? Do you have a product with a longer horizon? So if you're going to be shipping something at the end of this year, then that really gives you a, a lot of planning window there. So 
I would suggest, you know, Angular 2 makes a lot of sense immediately. But you also have to consider the team you have. Is it an existing team of Angular 1 developers? And are you planning to transition back end developers to Angular? Um, what is the team now and what is the team going to be? And how is that going to impact whether or not you should move to Angular 2? So the easy cases, you have a team of Angular 1 developers. You need a product tomorrow. You have no time to train. The future doesn't really matter. You just need to get the product out. Stick with Angular 1. It would make sense in most cases. If you're planning a new product with a longer time horizon, you have time to train developers or hire externally, jump into Angular 2. Those are the easy cases. You have a long time frame, it's a new product, or you have a, uh, an existing product, but you need to get things updated and shipped tomorrow. You know, stick with Angular 1, go with Angular 2. But the difficult cases, that's what most people have to deal with. And for that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Yuri, and he's going to walk through some of the more interesting cases for whether or not you should go with Angular 2 now, later, or how to go to it now. Hello, this is Yuri Takev, the CTO of Angular.io, and yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with the more difficult case, which unfortunately are the cases that you, a lot of us are going to, a lot of people are going to find themselves in. So let's look at some of the specifics of a more common case, is that first of all, you have a product and you have a team and you need new features, right? So, which is to say that you can't really um, you, you, you do not have a luxury of starting with Greenfield, uh, either in terms of product or in terms of a team, and you also cannot really take a break from delivering new features because you've got users and there are things that they're asking for. So you'll sort of have to do a bit of an open heart surgery on your product, right, uh, ultimately, in order to migrate it to uh, Angular 2. Now, at the same time, you also are not in the category where you need to ship things tomorrow and that's all that matters. You are in a situation where you have to think about the future because this is a product. This is not a product that's, you know, needs to be shipped but then kind of going to be, you know, phased out in the next few months. It's a product that you actually expect to maintain over the many months or over many years. And in that sense, you actually have to be thinking about the future. So in this case, so this is, this is a difficult case, but that's a difficult case that a lot of uh, projects are going to find themselves in. So what do you do? Well, you should plan on moving from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Like that much is clear. Uh, but at the same time, you need a migration strategy. You cannot just go ahead and actually start doing that without thinking because you need to attend to the, to the needs of your current user base and sort of factor all of those things in. So when thinking through those difficult cases, you kind of have to also keep in mind that you are in many ways going to be doing two migrations. Uh, because if you have a um, if you have a, a, a product, then chances are you have a team, and so what you will effectively be doing is that first you're going to be migrating the first one, one, the first one of the tasks is migrating your code. That's the kind of more obvious thing that people think about. Uh, but you will also be migrating your team, and one of the things that we want to stress is that in some ways, I mean, you cannot you can start migrating your team before you really bite the bullet with Angular 2 uh, code migration, but you probably want to be careful about doing it the other way around. I mean, if you're going to be moving your uh, code, your team needs to be ready for this. So let me talk a little bit about kind of upgrading your Angular 1 team. So the, the key point to keep in mind is that there's two different things that, like the things that you need to learn, they fall into two camps into two groups. I mean, first is that there's, your team will need to learn Angular 2 proper. Uh, and the most important uh, ingredient of that is learning component-oriented architecture. So Angular in, uh, 2 requires you to organize your components in a very disciplined way. And this is different from the way a lot of Angular 2, Angular 1 projects are organized. It's possible to do that. Um, in Angular 1, we've been advocating doing this for a while, but that's not the way a lot of Angular 1 projects is written. That's not a lot. That's not the way a lot of Angular 1 developers have been trained to work. So that's something that is a big learning curve for that. But in addition to that, there's just been massive changes in the, uh, in, in the, in the JavaScript stack over the last year, really literally month by month. And so if you are going to be moving to Angular 2, you have to kind of keep in mind that Angular 2 community or Angular has really embraced what we could call the 2016 JavaScript. Uh, 
uh, like sort of the best practices that really have emerged over the last uh, couple of years. Again, a lot of Angular One projects have not actually adopted a lot of those. So those, so those best practices include um, um, ES6 or TypeScript, uh, in case of Angular 2, probably TypeScript, uh, new build tools such as Webpack, uh, immutable data structures, uh, and unidirectional architecture, just to main, name some of the sort of most important things. Now, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that you actually can be start basically making a down payment on this uh, second thing, second group of things, basically all of the different tools that... Um, Okay, sorry. Uh, so you can actually basically start making down payment on the uh, on those um, other elements of the stack now, regardless of whether you want to, whether you actually feel ready to move to full on Angular two migration. So, so in that sense, those are two different things. Now, you also may at this point be potentially looking outside Angular for your. Um, hiring needs, in particular, if you're hiring people from outside, uh, consider looking at React developers too. So, I mean, Angular 2, a lot of things in Angular 2 have been uh, brought in concepts that were, have also been used widely in React in community. And in that sense, uh, we've been finding ourselves that the best Angular to Angular developers are really at this point developer Angular developers who also are quite familiar with React. Now, obviously, if you're going to be doing migration from Angular One, you will need developers who are actually intimately familiar with Angular One and all of its quirks. So, in that sense, you know you don't want to hire a team of React developers and bring them and ask them to migrate your Angular One project. Over. What you may want to consider is mixed teams. So maybe you could actually supplement some of your existing Angular 1 team with um, developers from outside who actually either bring in Angular 2 experience, obviously there's not a lot of people out there right now with Angular 2 experience, or people who have been working with React. I mean, we've been at Angular, we've been encouraging people to really learn both. Uh, and that's been an important part of our strategy. We recommend the same thing. And a few words about backend developers. So, I mean, a lot of companies are looking to convert their backend developers to uh, front end. And um, this used to be our preferred strategy where we really sort of take the position that the best front end developers would be developers who up until recently have been doing backend. This has been changing. I mean, the JavaScript has really come in, into its own in the recent uh, years. And there is really a lot of people out there who have years of JavaScript experience. And it's really important to kind of keep in mind that modern JavaScript has evolved, in its, especially with ES6, into its own language that have been, and the development practice have been moving increasingly from MVC. Now, Angular 2 is probably the most palatable framework for people coming from Java and .NET. Uh, and in that sense, if you are um, moving developers from those technologies and they're gonna be learning Angular 2, they're gonna actually gonna find themselves a lot more at home with Angular 2 than, uh, with, than they would, for instance, with React. Uh, but at the same time, you kind of have to keep in mind, I mean, Angular 2 is not Java and it's, the, 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 the similarities may be somewhat superficial and you have to keep in mind that underlying modern JavaScript is really the new functional approach that stresses uh, immutability. Now, meanwhile, if uh, you have an option to poach some Scylla or Clojure developers and bring them into front end, those will probably feel at home in modern JavaScript and in Angular 2 in particular. So now, there's some easy ways. I mean, if you are, if you want to just sort of dip your toes into all of this and start uh, softly, there are a few easy ways to get started. The first one is do a small Angular 2 project, right? Uh, and you'll keep your, or you could be keeping your main application for a while uh, in, in its Angular 1 form, but even then at least get started on building a small Angular 2 project so you get familiar with it. You could also try to convert a small uh, code base. And then first, and the last one is the, those other constituent technologies, again, you can start adopting them now. Like regardless of how you feel about Angular 2, you ought to be jumping into TypeScript, adopting modern build tools such as Webpack, looking at uh, immutable architecture and those kind of things. Now, 
let's now talk about the act. But no, what, what if you actually, but you really ought to be thinking about real full on migration. So let's talk about some of the approaches that you could take towards migrating your code. Well, the, fir and the first question that you should ask yourself before you make any plans, and that would determine your uh, decision between the, the approach that I'm going to present, is what's the state of your code base? A lot of Angular, the reality is a lot of Angular 1 projects are in poor state. Now, you, Angular 1 can be written well. I mean, there's projects out there that use Angular 1 in, in a really in a good way, but that's not a lot of projects. A lot of projects in, in a really poor state. And the most common problems are dollar scope all over the all over your code, fat controllers, so which is to sort of say two problems. I mean, first you're using controllers rather than directives, and second, they are there's a lot of code in your controllers. And also a lot of people really have projects that do not have much in terms of unit testing. So as a general rule of thumb, I mean, the messier the code base, the more it has dollar scope, fat controls, blah, blah, the harder it will be for you to migrate it. Now, on the flip side, of course, the messier your code base, the more you actually have to gain from migration. I mean, if you are moving a pristine, perfectly beautiful uh, Angular 1 code base, you will get a, a big uh, gain in performance moving to Angular 2. But I mean, but you're going to be moving from good architecture to good architecture. Now, if you're moving, on the other hand, from really messy code, if you were to manage to migrate it, then you would actually have something that's going to be a lot more maintainable and a lot more scalable. So the first approach that I want to talk about is uh, refactor straight into Angular 2. So basically, you're just going to go ahead and take your, and this is really only uh, works. So this, this would really only work if you are actually switching to, uh, if, you, if your code is, is, is in a really good uh, state. So in this case, the process would look roughly like this. You will probably want to update your uh, code to use Angular's new component router. Uh, you will then use a tool called ng-upgrade that I will discuss in more details to switch, uh, to move, uh, to basically run your app in hybrid mode for a short period of time, where you will have Angular 1 and Angular 2 components living together. And then you will switch to finally Angular 2. And uh, you know, in theory, you could get done fairly quickly. But again, this would only really work for those who have done their homework. I mean, if, you, if your Angular 1 code base is fully ready for this migration, which for most people, it won't be the case. Now, the next three approaches are for sort of dealing with a messier code base. So the second approach is you refactor towards Angular 2. So now in this approach, you basically say, let's focus now on refactoring. Let's leave migration for later. Uh, you, so you're not going to basically really running Angular 2, but you're going to start doing all of those other things that I've mentioned before, uh, getting rid of dollar scope, getting rid of fat controllers, uh, and, uh, you know, adopting TypeScript, adopting immutable architecture, and all of those things. So those are the things you want to focus on. Again, TypeScript, dollar scope, controllers, moving to thin. And you want your directives, so you want to switch to directives, and you want your directives to be ng, what I'm calling ng upgradable, which is to say that they, they would be the type of directives that would work with ng upgrade that will make it easier for you to later combine um, them with Angular 2 components. Now, the benefit of this approach is that you can actually do 80 to 90 percent of the work that needs to be done for the migration with fairly little risk uh, because you're still using Angular 1. Uh, you know, you don't need to worry about stability or anything of that. So you don't need to learn new features of Angular 2. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's relatively safe. Now, the downside, of course, is you're going to also miss on many of the benefits that actually Angular 2 brings. So this is a conservative approach that works for those who have the time to spare and who, on the other hand, really want to not run any risks. The third approach is kind of the opposite of that. This is rewrite it all at once. Uh, you know, there's not a lot to recommend in this approach other than the adrenaline rush that you get from really not knowing how it's going to come out. I mean, the chances are it's not going to end well, uh, unless your application is really simple. Uh, it, I mean, this approach is really, really risky. I mean, if you're going to start um, rewriting a massive application and basically not planning on running it and deploying it until it's all fully converted to Angular 2, then 
chances are this is not going to end well. So now this approach might make sense if your app is very simple, if you can tolerate risk, or if it's an app that you, for other reasons, were already thinking of rewriting from scratch anyway, though even then you kind of got to, you always have to worry a lot about uh, trying to rewrite everything. So the fourth approach, the fourth approach I think is the one that really makes sense for most organizations. And this is rewriting and refactoring in steps. So under this approach, you will plan to run your application in a hybrid Angular 1, Angular 2 mode, which is to say it's going to combine Angular 1 pieces and Angular 2 pieces. And you're going to move through your Angular 1 pieces one by one and either rewrite or refactor them depending on what seems more appropriate for every particular element. Uh, this is somewhat similar to approach one, except for in this case, you're going to be planning on being in this hybrid mode actually for a while. I mean, you're going to be deploying this to production in a hybrid mode. And the key tool to doing this is ng-upgrade. So let me say a few more words about ng-upgrade. It's, um, it's a tool that basically gives, allows you to expose Angular 1 services to Angular 2 components and vice versa. It allows you to use Angular 2 components inside Angular 1, inside of an Angular 1 application. And it allows you to use certain Angular 1 directives inside Angular 2 components. Now, this requires sort of a footnote that it's, it's not any, you cannot just plan to use any Angular 1 directive inside of Angular 2 component and the list of uh, the, the set of things, the, the requirements that your Angular 1 directives need to satisfy is fairly uh, demanding. So a lot of chances are if you have a really messy code base, then most of your existing Angular 1 components probably won't cut it in terms of being incorporated into an Angular, in, inside of an Angular 2 application. And then down the line, you will need to switch to component router, which is the new Angular router. So if you're using something like UI router, you could be using this for a while. You could start with services and Angular 2, smaller Angular 2 components, but eventually Angular, switching to Angular 2 router will be required before you can actually switch to uh, full screens composed to Angular 2. And the important thing with this approach is that you really want to, I mean, you're going to be putting a decent amount of faith into Angular NG upgrade. So you want to understand its limitations before you begin. So within this approach, there's a few sub approaches. Uh, so one of them is, one approach is you could do services first. So you start off by converting your Angular services to, uh, your Angular 1 services to Angular 2 services. Uh, you start refactoring existing controller code into services, and this you could be going straight to Angular 2 services. Uh, you should be writing tests for those services if you, if you haven't been doing that before. The second approach that you, you could think of is uh, screen by screen, where you basically say, okay, well, let's take a feature, let's take a chunk of the application, convert that to Angular 2. And uh, another approach is to work bottom up, so do the, convert the smaller component to Angular 2 first, and then the third approach that you could, in theory, contemplate, though I would recommend against, would be top-down, where you say, let's actually try to run uh, plug-in pieces of Angular 1 application into a new Angular 2 application. This would work in some cases, but probably not in most cases. So our recommendation, this is for probably what makes sense for most migrations at this point, is start with services. And again, as you writing your services, write unit tests. Uh, the nice thing about starting with services is it's a fairly low risk uh, step. Then proceed to low level components. So you would want to make small widgets out of Angular 2. You will convert your buttons to Angular 2, your date pickers, you, whatever it is that you're using, and then work your way up. So you, you will be converting your full on screens to Angular 2 as the last step in this process. And then finally, as you are actually introducing new sections, you would probably want to start thinking about introducing unidirectional, like full-on unidirectional architecture. This is something that you really want to switch on as, to, as part of this migration, but that may be something that would come at a later point. Finally, a few words about timing in terms of when would you want to start uh, on all of this. Um, NG Upgrade, in our experience with it, does have a few kinks and some limitations, but it really should be actually good to go soon. Uh, and if, uh, so if you're doing a massive rewrite, then 
you may not want to be planning on actually deploying things to production like with ng upgrade this month but you really can start on refactoring and getting ready and basically plan to be um, launching your refactored code in ng upgrade mode in in a couple of months uh, and we'll be keeping you updated about how um, how our experience works with, with, with that. Now, on the flip side, if you are looking for at new projects, you should really consider Angular 2 today. I mean, there's really not a lot of uh, things to recommend waiting uh, at this point, because if you're gonna start a new project in Angular 1, you're gonna basically writing code that you know that you're gonna be rewriting. I mean, if you go that route, you should at least be following uh, all of the like Angular 2 style development that we have a lot, lots of materials on that, but but really at this point for new projects, Angular 2 is probably the way to go. Back to Nick. All right, so uh, thank you everyone. So just a few quick conclusions and some next steps. So most companies should be investing significant effort into their Angular 2 initiatives now. I think uh, we've gone through most of the cases there, so you should be able to adopt some of those uh, planning sort of concepts and put together your plan and, and start rolling with Angular 2. Um, we would suggest Angular 2 training for your team and let them plan more effectively. Um, this is highly recommended due to the shift in thinking and how Angular 2 applications are built. And uh, if companies are interested, a two-day readiness assessment from uh, some Angular 2 uh, companies or consultants can drastically impact your success because there's a, a big variation in how easy a code base can be moved based upon the state of it, the service architecture, and the use of dollar scope, as Yuri had talked about. Um, if you're interested uh, in following up with us, we have some Angular 2 training webinars coming up. So if you go to uh, Rangle.io Services JavaScript Training, we have an online training on February 1st and 2nd. So it's two half-day sessions, so it's easy to fit into a week. Uh, we have in-class in Toronto, January 27th and 28th. This is a longer course, it's two full-day sessions. Uh, custom on-site as needed, so email uh, training at wrangle.io if interested. And then we're going to be continuing our Angular 2 webinar series. Uh, you can go to our resources page to get some more details and to sign up if you haven't yet. But on January 22nd, uh, we'll be doing an overview of Angular 2, so a little more of a deep dive in some of the concepts, but it's only an hour, so it would be a very abbreviated form of our training. On February 2nd, we'll be talking about Angular 2 workflow and some of the new tooling in Batarangle. And then on February 24th, we'll be doing a webinar specifically on migration practices. And so with that, uh, that's the end of the webinar. If you have questions, you can post them to the question list. Uh, we understand uh, it's a lot of content, so you can also email us or uh, get to it, reach us on Twitter. And if you want to email us uh, specifically, I should put those up here, but it's nick at wrangle.io, first name, and uh, yuri at wrangle.io.